All right, Fano. I am very excited to have our next guest with us. I have to admit, um, I am very new to uh, the world in which uh, this ariki, I will say, uh, this rangatira um, pertains to. I, I've started taking more of an invested interest lately, um, but I am very new to it. And it was funny, um, I, this, this corridor came about because I emailed uh, asking for some stuff around puanga and matariki, uh, for some mahi that we've got coming up around those times here in Aurohi of Taranaki. And we had a conversation that way, and it just felt pretty natural to say, by the way, bro, do you want to come on my podcast? <laughs> and, uh, and here we are, Noreda. Uh, it's in Matsu. If you could please introduce yourself and uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about who you are for those that don't know. Um, so my name is Rangi Mataamua. Uh, I am from um, uh, Norua Tahunaho. Um, so and me Waikare Moana. So my family connections are actually into Tuhoi. Um, I am from two little communities really of Waikare Moana and Rua Tahuna. But um, my grandparent. Uh, my grandfather and my dad were born in the region but left when my dad was a small child and um, went to the home of my grandmother's people which is uh, in Levin. Oh. Uh, I grew up around the people of Muopoko um, and I did all my schooling and my uh, secondary schooling within the region of Manawatu and Horofenua and um, I've pretty much since I finished, I've pretty much mostly had a career as an academic within different institutions, <laughs> um, mostly uh, Victoria University, uh, Massey, and most recently at Waikato University. So, um, yeah, I suppose most people know me perhaps uh, for the work I do in the space of Māori astronomy, and in particular Matariki, and... Um, that's where I um, get most of, I, I, I suppose, most of my um, work and, and the stuff that I do is in that arena. Uh, so, yeah, a quote in me. Kia ora, bro. So, to Pato Tuatahi, the first question I've got, because you've mentioned school, and I'm always interested to know, how were you as a student? Would you say that you are good, bad, interested, not interested? Um, I think I was pretty much towards the bottom end of the school uh, classroom. I don't think I really showed much interest uh, in schooling, even though it was such an important thing for my parents and my grandparents. Um, really, uh, you know, none of them went very far past um, college at all. In fact, my parents went to college and wouldn't have gone past the fifth form. And then it was really an important thing for them I would have been very much average of average until I came to a teacher who kind of really helped me in my fourth form. I went to a boarding school, Hotopalda College, just out of Fielding. Oh, you're a boy. I was five years there. And in my fourth form, I was just kind of going through the motions academically until a particular teacher saw something in me and she really kind of just helped me with a couple of things. And then if I'm honest, in about a three-week, four-week period, so much fell into place. It just all started to click off. And she made a comment to me. She said, look, I think you're a lot smarter than you're really giving yourself credit for. Perhaps if you just apply yourself in this way. And she started to encourage me. And I think it was that, that moment that I really turned the corner and you know, went all the way, I guess, in terms of academics um, <laughs> to get every degree I think I could could get and uh, ended up uh, finally with a PhD and then as a professor at a university. And that pretty much happened because of the words of encouragement from that one teacher. But let's talk about that three or four weeks then, bro, because that's obviously a, a pivotal moment in your life. In terms of the uh, recognition, like that, that, that key sentence, I guess, that, that kind of the kiwaha that, you know, you're a lot smarter than what you're giving yourself credit for. So can I ask, because I have a similar story, bro, which is quite crack up that I'll, that I'll share with you. But I, and I'm, I'm drawing from my own experience here as I asked this question. Were you actually, did you actually think that you weren't that switched on? Or did you not want to accept the responsibility that strip switched on people have to accept? <laughs> That's a really good question. And I actually think it's the latter. I actually think what 
me just cruising allowed me to stick under the radar. I'm so with you. <laughs> I'm so with you. <laughs> I didn't have to push myself. And yeah, other people are like, man, they're smart. And when like the teacher would talk about something, I understood what they were, were talking about, but I didn't want to really put myself out there in case, you know, I had to put myself out there, right? And yeah. I was like, oh, no, no, I'll just sit back. And I just probably did what I had to do to get by. She just, I don't know, she, it, it was a, the three, four week period. She called me aside. I remember too, because it was in the winter and we were playing rugby. And um, she asked me just to do a couple of extra things for her English class. She was my English uh, teacher. She said, look, um, Mary Dinsdale was her name. I was going to ask. She said, look, yeah, uh, can you, we had some great teachers. And she, for me, really helped me. She said, look, for your English class, can you honestly just write three paragraphs on this creative writing piece just around something that interests you? And so I wrote it. I, I wrote a piece. Um, actually, I wrote it about a rugby game, but it wasn't the, the, the subject matter. What she was looking for was, you know, sentence structures and use of words and vocab and the way that I kind of wove a story together. And for some reason, she gave me feedback and she spoke to me about the way you write and why it's important and how to convey a message. And when she said that, what message are you trying to convey? And think about the words and the feelings in the words. What are you trying to get across? Excitement, horror, fear, empathy. And it just clicked. I thought, oh, I understand how to do that. I went off, wrote this paper, gave it back, and she marked it. And she gave me an A plus for this assignment. And I saw that. I saw my name. I saw the A plus. Um, I saw the smile on her face and it just at that instant, it was a real sense of pride in me. And so I decided, oh, well, I'm just going to do everything that I can do across all of my classes. And it just fell into place. But she constantly for a month followed up with me, asked how my math was going, asked how science was going. And um, yeah, I think from that point, it really turned for me about, um, you know, I could actually do it and there wasn't a fear of doing it anymore. I know you were pretty young at the time, but I wonder if you can remember, do you remember like having, or how that change in you was perceived by others? Like, did your parents notice this change? Did your peers notice this change? Were there people in your life that went, bro, what's happened here? Like the bro's woken up or, you know, whatever, however they might've framed it. Did you, do you can you recall any of that? I can remember uh, the end of the year in my fourth form and actually coming home and my reports turned up and I had this English um, uh, kind of categories for the for the work that I'd done and I remember that there was A was the top category for um, comprehension I guess and work and attitude the top was one and there was like 12 categories and I think in 10 I had A1 and then a two, I had a and a two. And I remember my grandfather's face looking at it and he read and he looked at it and I knew he was quite happy. I knew and I really felt a sense of pride. <laughs> but then in his typical <laughs> humble kind of grounded way, he says, so why are there two twos on here? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> two, yeah. two wasn't bad. It just meant that I there were parts of it that it took me a little while to get. And I tried to explain that to him. He's like, mm, okay. But my parents noticed it. And um, my mum in particular really at that moment started to become invested in, in more so in my education. And then I did relatively well in the fifth form and sixth form and seventh form and uni. And I carried on. Um, I, I, I do remember, I do remember that sense of, wow, okay. Um, he's got his own thoughts and he's actually, he's reading, you know, <laughs> he's applying himself, he's getting good grades. Um, that really uh, was, uh, it helped me connect, I think, to the others around me. And I don't think, this is just me reflecting back now, but as children and as even when we're at college, we don't understand the sacrifices at times our parents and others make for us. I don't think we do um, until we become them ourselves sort of thing, you know? 
And now I understand, you know, my parents and grandparents went without because we, I didn't come from, you know, upper class. Mm. I came from that very mildy, you know, um, my, 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 my father and mother were nurses at a hospital. So we weren't rolling (laughs) and we had, they had four kids at boarding school and they sacrificed so we could do well. And I now think, you know, as a parent, if you're sacrificing for your children and your children uh, kind of respond to that sacrifice by doing the best that they can do, that must be rewarding. It's rewarding for me with my own kids. And um, I'm glad that for me, I'm hoping that they'd look back on it and think that the investment and sacrifice they made was worth it. Um, I didn't realize the sacrifice they made until much later, and I'm very grateful for it. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's it's such a thing to kind of grow up and realize, right? That like becomes a pivotal moment. I I don't think there's an age where it happens. It's just I guess experience or whatever that we realize that hey, our parents are just people too. There was there's no template, yeah. there's no guide, there's no have to, how to, um, there's no um, you know cookie cutter whānau that we see displayed to us on TV that doesn't exist everyone's just doing the best they can with the best they have at the time that they have it. And there comes a moment, right, where that, where that changes, you've still realized that. And I, that's a moment of growing up. Yeah. Kia ora. It is so true. You're so right. Uh, I think you, it happens at different ages for different people. And, you know, sometimes it never happens for some people, you know, uh, you can go through the life being really entitled or really, you know, uh, dismissive of the things the, the the effort and the support you get from others and then you know if I think for some you click onto it relatively quickly and yeah I will never forget the sacrifice others made so I can be in this really for the most part quite a privileged position and that in turn makes me responsible to give back to those who you know because it's it's got to be a continuous thing right yeah. You get given, and then you get to a point where you give. It can't be you get given, and then that's it, you know, because that you have to give. And I think by giving, that that continues the, you know, you talked about balance before we come on. I think that's a really important part of balance, is you are rewarded by the gifts you're given throughout your life, but they're only truly, truly, truly realized when you give those to someone else. Yeah, there's, I think there's something very Māori about what we're talking about here and that, you know, legacy is almost everything in terms of, and, and I know it's easier to think sometimes of legacy as being something, only something you inherit. It, it can be easy to forget about the part that you're meant to pass it on as yeah, well. Right. And I yeah, think right. a, lot, a lot of key decisions, bro, like I, 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 probably since, I'd say since February, like I'm, I'm borderline the world's indecisive man, bro. Just between you, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm borderline the world's most indecisive man. I actually had, uh, had a crack up conversation with a phenomenon of mine yesterday. He was, he was on um, Instagram Live and he was just venting out loud, like, "I'm so indecisive. What is wrong with me?" And I sent him a request, and I jumped on live with him, and we just had a corridor, and. Um, I, I yeah, am super indecisive as well, bro, but, but something that's been really centering for me or a bit of a, a I don't know if it's a whakatoki or kiwaha, but just something that I kind of say to myself now before I have to make a decision so that I make the decision is, um, are you being a good ancestor? And I kind of, oh, yeah. I, I sit on that for a little while and I think, okay, is my action or more importantly for me in my case, my inaction <laughs> is this, is this making me a good ancestor? And then I think, you know, when you talk about, because I'd have to admit, bro, for a long part of my life, I probably was completely ignorant um, to the fact that a lot of things were going on around me in order for me to be in a position of privilege and do the things I can. You know, like it was, it didn't compute to me that I got to wake up and go to school because there were people that went to work and did the mahi to pay for that school and to pay for that house. It is. And as kids, we don't. That's that's mm. that's our job, you know. We're called rangatahi for the re- for a reason. We we only look after the tahi, 
and then you become <laughs> a ranga tira when you look after the tira and look after everyone. But that that place, bro, with the ranga tahitanga, when you just looking after yourself, and then you have that moment where you click, like, okay, someone created space for me. How do I now create space for other people to enjoy what I enjoy? It relates yeah. to what you're saying, yeah? Yeah, kia ora. Awesome. So then with the with you having this sudden um, investment or, or vigor for academia, <laughs> tell me tell me about that journey. So things changed at school. You started applying yourself a bit more. Your whanau seemed to come on board a bit more. How did that go? Because there'd be a lot of people listening because I get a few kind of people that are finishing up school and they're trying to decide what to do after school. Talk me through your process and what you went through in that kind of time. Uh, so um, when I was in my... Um, Fifth form, sixth form, fifth form, 1989. I, um, I started, uh, you know, really, the, by the time I was in my fifth form, I was like, I was away. You know, I was, I was just reading and, and, and really invested. And, and, and you know, you, you, you're a young man. So you're, you've got those elements going on. I was an all-male boarding school. So yeah. we didn't have the distraction of, of, um, of the opposite sex. Mm-hmm. And we 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 were probably would have been more of a distract, distraction for them anyway. So we focused on certain certain things, you know, like sports was really important, but really education. I was with a great cohort of people. Um, you know, we were only a small seven form. Uh, there was only twelve of us, but you know, within that group, there's ones now a judge, you know, lawyers, people that own their own businesses. It just was this really tight group and we pushed each other academically sporting wise and I just became caught up in that so a cohort is really really important but in 1989 I was doing the um the Maori uh, manu kōrero speech competitions and I was lucky enough to to win that for a couple of years at our regionals and um to learn uh, I called it. I went down to Wellington, taken by my grandfather because we were living in Levin, to one of uh, my uncles, um, Professor Po Tiamara. And I've pretty much been with Po since that time as a student of his. And, you know, when he began to teach me, I was just absolutely captivated. And I asked what he did, and he talked about um, working at the university and his job as a lecturer and as an academic. And in that instant, I was like, I want to be, I want to be, I want that. I want to be like him. He was my idol and in many ways, he still is. Um, and I followed in his footsteps um, for pretty much my entire career for the most part. Got to university and, um, you know, they talked about, you know, degrees and I thought to myself, yeah, I, I'm going to get a PhD. I'm just going to get it. I just instantly set my mind on that. And um, I suppose I just guess I'm perhaps driven like that anyway, but I had these awesome role models and support systems around me. So, you know, if I hadn't have done that, I think I would have been an absolute failure. And then getting a PhD and working at the university and being uh, around, you know, as I began to mingle and my circle grew much wider, uh, influential academics. I mean, I have spent time with and have worked in the same space as the likes of Mason Jury, Farihuya Milroy. I've been, you know, have lucky enough to have Timothy Kari to, uh, Linda Smith, um, people like Brendan Hokofitu, um, some um, of the countries of Māori, the most significant academics, and they've become colleagues throughout the years. And when I did begin a bit, uh, to work at the university, I thought, yeah, I'm going to be a professor. I'm going to work towards that. And it wasn't, I never told people. I just set that internal goal for me. And when I got there, um, you know, really, <laughs> when I graduated, when I got my PhD or any other degree, uh, when I got a, my professorship, my first thought was to my grandparents. My parents are still alive now, but I lost my grandfather before not too long before I got my PhD and then my grandmother um, not too long after and instantly you know as soon as that recognition or you achieve something like that 
my first thought was, wow, the sacrifice they made so I can be here. <laughs> That's the first thought. So I suppose for me, I've always had a goal, an academic goal. I never had a financial goal, and I think that's reflective in my poor bank balance. <laughs> uh, I, I, I never really had, you know, any other goal except I wanted to learn. I wanted to understand knowledge. Um, it wasn't about the goal really sometimes. Well, for the most part, it was about the knowledge and then being involved in careers. Bro, I got you know, employed to think, to read, and to talk, and to learn. It was, uh, it's been a really privileged journey to this date, and I'm really, really lucky. You mentioned some of those people that you um, were fortunate enough to, to kind of rub shoulders with, or buddy up with, and do some money with. Some of those names, as you said, you know, there's some pretty big, some pretty big names and some pretty renowned nangatira in different circles, different areas, many different spaces. Was there ever a moment where you thought, like, am I worthy of this? Am I meant to be here? Like, is there any sort of, was there ever any imposter syndrome? <laughs> um, no. Um, oh, don't get me. You're in awe. I mean, I was, wow. You yeah. know, um, first, I was like, wow, you know, I get to be with these people. But I think the way that they are, I never was made to feel like that. Uh, I did, I knew Poe and I'd uh, been a student of his through my university career. And when I went to Te Panekiretango Te Reo Māori, um, there was also another, two other koro of mine, Farihuia and Timotin. And I was, it was a privilege to learn off them. Mason Jury is one of the smartest, uh, forward thinking, yet humble people I know and I you had the privilege of of spending some time with him uh, while I was at Massey not a lot but he he was uh, a role model and someone that I really um you know really tried to mimic in some ways I guess probably very poorly but <laughs> um what I got from him is 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 he had that humility not to make you feel unworthy in fact they reinforced the fact all of the time all of them, those great role models of mine, and um, in particular, uh, my uncle Poe, is that um, you are worthy, and, and you, you can be what, you know, it was pretty much the cliche, you can do whatever you want to do, yeah. and I think they also understand, and have always understood, they're also part of this chain, right, the latest link, and they've received, and now it's passing on um, along their journey. It's funny, you know, like I... Because I'm not an academic by any means, <laughs> but you know, so I, I, um, but what I'm starting to learn, and you're kind of speaking to it indirectly, I think, and I'm interested to get your thoughts here. So I've I've just started my masters this year, um, so I'm doing my, my masters in That's indigenous cool. leadership um, through the University of Canterbury, and so. Yeah, so you're probably going to know some people for sure. <laughs> I can see your face lighting up. So yeah. is that with um, Che Wilson and Bentham yeah. and yeah. our awesome, yeah. awesome that, program, great Sasha, program? Sasha. Sasha. Sasha, yeah. Um, and I, um, and Garrett Cooper, he's someone that I, yeah, I, I connected with that I resonated with straight away. And we're very similar in our train of thought and having that kin has been amazing. But what I've actually learned, so, so growing up, I was like, no, Academics isn't for me, and I'll be honest, yeah, and, and no offense to anyone listening that has gone to university, and my brothers used to kind of hate me because I used to say it all the time, is that university teaches you to be like everyone else. That's what I used to <laughs> that, that, that's, that's what I used to say. But what I've learned, but what I've learned, bro, in my small time of doing this master's and doing that course, is that, and I don't mean uni, but what I'm actually learning in the mahi that I'm doing, and it sounds like you got a similar sort of apprenticeship with all these langatira that you mentioned is that, and we talked about boxes at the start, actually, before he came on air. It's almost like we've been taught somewhere along the way, whether you want to say it's a colonial impression or influence, that there is a box or there's a criteria that we must achieve or fit into. What I've actually learned from this master's that I'm doing is that 
there is no box there is no criteria you get to decide what the box and the criteria is and in that, and in that effect uni is actually like people say to me what are you learning now that you're at uni i was like honestly i'm not learning anything i'm, un <laughs> I'm unlearning a lot of stuff and that sounds similar to what you're speaking about is that right no i think that's right firstly i just want to say that is a great program that you're on mm. they are some really um uh you know bentham uh, his work that he did, particularly with Te Wano Aotearoa, to shape that um, that institution for such a long time and have an uh, impact upon um, communities right across um, the country, I think is, you know, uh, so crucial. And, and uh, Che, who's a cousin of mine, yeah. um, uh, we're connected through our links into the Horofenua region, and um, he's another... Um, person at the forefront of um, thinking about how we can involve a tikanga Māori within our modern colonised society, which it is, which it is. Yeah. You're exactly right. You know, universities are set up under a particular structure and a particular approach. And anyone in that training will realise after some time that you actually are part of this into a box mentality. Mm -hmm. Because that's... Um, you know, they've got this, uh, particularly our universities are fairly much um, modelled off um, uh, the very forward and very mm, proper, um, for want of a better word, formal is the word I'm looking for, uh, British institutions um, like Oxford and Cambridge. And we like to kind of mimic that style of teaching. And I think that Māori, rightly so, since the time of Ngata, uh, really pushed for a Māori element within those higher-end institutions to argue that Māori and our subject matter sits alongside any other subject matter in the in the in the in the world, yeah, and in the country, and they were denied for a long time. And then we finally, in the seventies, I think it was um, Hirini Mukomid might have established the first Māori Studies Department. I think that might have been seventy nine around then, and it's grown since since then. I'm the next wave, a couple of waves later in the process where we are looking to shape independent thinkers within the institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, still grounded within those institutions, but to have this critical, independently thinking academic who actually understands the system that they're working within in the confines, but also pushes the boundaries of what is accepted, pushes the boundaries of how things can be done. Um, there are, there is, right up to this day, I've been vocal about it beforehand, institutional racism that exists within the education sector, and particularly at those real old boy kind of upper end tertiary structures where in many ways they think at times that those systems are beyond reproach. And for us as Māori, you know, people say to me, and I've had it before as well, that criticism, oh, your university can't tell us anything about life, anything. And while I think some of the criticism is valid, uh, I think that it gave me a particular training, discipline of mind and um, an approach to view my world and to be able to work within that system and outside that I'm very proud of actually. I'm, I'm not ashamed to say I can fact, I'm quite proud to say of the institutions that I come from. I'm also proud to say that um, the growing influence of our Māori wānanga and some of these other programs that are looking to reshape the way we look at our education system and the fact that Mātauranga Māori is beginning to infiltrate right across every sector of our Aotearoa society, I'm waiting for the next generation because I think they're going to take it to a completely different level and um, really work at the interface between traditional Māori knowledge and, and modern education and even science. And that's, you know, my, my hope is that, you know, in my little, little way, I can help have a little bit of an influence for this next generation to come through and take things up to that next level. Sure, and I think there's a lot of 
um, you have a lot of relevance in what you're describing. And, and everything you've said, like, <laughs> this is not very often that I have a podcast with someone and I agree with most things they're saying. It's quite, <laughs> a, it's quite, it's quite often we get into a debate or a discussion or some backwards and forwards, but uh, it's, it's, it's actually quite refreshing to um, yeah, have, have someone who's kind of thinking along the same train thoughts that I am. And I'm absolutely uh, invigorated and motivated by the fact that you know all these people and you're familiar with these people who <laughs> I'm lucky to be surrounded by and having quartered all with and being part of because yeah that definitely I guess adds a bit of a bit of weight to that and it's funny a part of the reason why I wanted to reach out to you too is because the last one that we had Che actually took us through like a little wire which illustrates the stars and where they are and places and things like that and I was like man this is cool and been practicing it to try and learn it and try and get it down and looking out at the stars and doing all those sorts of things one question I want to ask um, in terms of, oh, and, and also before I move on, I do want to say that I hold, hardly agree in terms of not just um, Mātauranga Māori, but Indigenous cultures all around the world. They're, the things that we innately know or that we've been taught throughout generations, they are making their way to the forefront, you know, and they are, they are going to be the things that save the world, in my view. When you look at sustainability, Get for example. Get older. Sustainability of the term alone cracks me up because the fact that it has to be defined, whereas throughout all of these indigenous cultures, looking after Papa Tuanuku and our Paiao is just, it's, it's, it's not even secondary, it's primary. It's, you know, and the fact that it's taken so long for people to go, oh, you know what we need to start doing? Prioritizing the environment. <laughs> and then, and then like you mentioned, these institutionalized, you know, colonial people that have gone that's a great idea it's like that's not a great idea you didn't discover that that's been something we've been talking about for ages like you can't claim that as well i think i think there's a lens that gets placed on our knowledge-based systems like oh yeah we think we're called savages bro like oh exactly vacant exactly vessels, every... hey, just was it the law of discovery or whatever vacant vessels yeah. they needed to put into us so we can be functioning humans even, even, even like, oh, when, when, when Tasman discovered New Zealand, huh? pretty hard to discover a place when there's a whole lot of people living on it, right? Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. like me saying, I'm going to down, down to the shop and I'm going to discover the warehouse. <laughs> I mean, like, it's just absurd. And there's this real funny thing for me, like, it's, it's a real um, colonial fragility and, and fear, you know, like, they can't do it before us. Like, you know, it's myths and legends unless it's Western and then it's science. Now, why is it? I want to know. Why is it that Māori never changed our story, never changed our narrative? In the beginning, the sky was stuck to the earth and all elements of life, you know, are stuck together. Everything that gives life to the whole cosmos and then it's forced apart and everything comes into being. Myths and legends. Until some white guy says, oh, actually, in the beginning... It was the singularity, and there was this big bang. Now it's science, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like Maori have always said we have fuck up to everything: uh, rocks, trees, birds, the stars, the sun, genealogy, all those things. It was absurd. Any basic one hundred and one Maori astronomy class, I'll say every element that makes up you, me, the air that we breathe, every object begins its life as stardust inside a star, which begins inside the big bang. So we're all related and connected to this same origin. I'm like, that, that's that lens thing for me. If it's ours, you know, like we must have sailed here on myths and legends and um, survived here and implemented this really um, intricate, detailed division of time and uh, new our environment. It's all myths and legends. And it only becomes science when a Western person comes and gives it a scientific name. So these are some of the things in my own work that I really... You know, one of my battlegrounds is, is to say, no, we've always been scientists, always. It's, uh, I, I, used, I used to call it, I've got to call it a new name now because I learned about the story um, from the uh, Whangunai <laughs> in regards to um, a tanifa that was slayed down there. I, so I call it Trojan horsing. And what, what I'm referring to is, as the mahi that you're doing and now the mahi that I'm doing now that I'm inside the institution now <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the mahi that you're doing is that you, you you get yourself in behind the gates of Troy 
and then now you're in a position where you can start undoing the mahi for, or not undoing the mahi but providing that tika or that balance in those places that are highly unbalanced you know it's killed it i think it's creating space that's what we do we create space space of if I, one for one of greater word i think at times we we brown up an institution because we it should be reflective of our society and who we are and it's it's not it's not it's not run it's not representative it's not balanced and that's a great word that you use in terms of the gender in terms of um race in terms of um um priority perhaps you know those institutions aren't they are often reflection only of a small um, part of the population and they're still built and still have the hangovers of the agendas of the assimilation kind of um, agenda that we went through you know where um, Maori and Polynesians would be good to work in factories and manual labor and uh, you know the academic or those um, professions uh, were the domain of of the fairer class mm. and um, to be able to get into those institutions and change it around so it reflects better who we are as a population and people is an important role, regardless of where we are, what the institution is. And so I'm really, you know, when you said that you'd come from that background where, where you would challenge your brothers, but then now to be on the inside playing the same role that I'm playing <laughs> and following on from, from, you know, a host of influential uh, female and Maori leaders and academics. So I think bro, that's pretty cool. Well, it's it's real buzzy. Like I, I had to like kind of check my ego, so to speak, before being enrolled <laughs> because one of the first things I thought of was for years and years and years, I've given people shit for going to uni. So, <laughs> so the first thing that's going to happen now that I'm going to uni is I know all these people are going to come back and go, hey, bro, do you remember when, you know? And that's what's happened. But I just had to say to them, yep, you know, you're absolutely right. I did say those things. I apologize mm -hmm. if that uh if that you know caused any sort of feelings or emotions within you. Yeah. <laughs> well, what, what, one of my favorite, uh, well, he is, he's my favorite um artist of all time and you know, musician is Bob Marley. I've always thought of him as not only an amazing musician and performer, but a prophet and a and uh, a wordsmith and a and a critical thinker of his time. And I Think to that song Babylon System, and I used to play it for my for my students. When he says the lies, the line, you know, um, building church and universities, uh, uh, teaching thieves and murderers. <laughs> that talks about that system, that Babylon system. That uh, and and what what he's referring to in that context for me is those systems of imperialism and colonization that reinforce the dominance of one culture and one race over another. And, um, you know, there is quite often those uh, institutions and places, uh, places um, do uh, dominate the, the narrative and really determine, you know, it's meant to be the conscience of society and they are reinforcing uh, these colonial underpinnings and our role in there is to question that to push back on the things that we don't like and it can be uncomfortable at sometimes then you need to understand what value you place on your values and what hat you're wearing I got a lesson from one of my mentors to say you know that no matter where you sit within the university or your employment always remember that the most important hat that you'll wear is your iwi one, not your not your work one, yeah. because work's not gonna bury you in their Rudu path. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good way to remember. It. You know, when you die, it's not your work that's gonna pick you up and bury you in their Uru path. It's us. I thought, yeah, okay. So I just think that, you know, do you feel the responsibility of that though? You know, that responsibility on you now? Of where I am. Yeah, you know, with the master's program and your role in this much bigger push within that institutional space. I th honestly, like, like my, a long story short, bro, of my personal journey, and I'm guessing you picked this up anyway, because um, you seem quite aware. <laughs> um, I, 
I have probably spent bro too much of my life running away from responsibility. And that's why I could ask you about when we started in terms of when you were a kid, were you not paying attention to avoid the responsibility or were you not paying attention because you genuinely, <laughs> you know, didn't think you were that smart or whatever. Um, I, I was the very, I'm very much the same. I have a similar story with a similar teacher who put a lot of time into me. Um, I have my careers lady. She helped me get into the mahi that I've been doing and I've been fortunate enough to kick down a few doors and do some more awesome mahi. Um, I definitely, I mean, I know the responsibility is there if, if that kind of answers the question, but it doesn't feel so burdensome now, especially mm. especially with being having a cohort. You know, you used the word cohort before. I've got a I've got a cohort now, um, awesome of, of amazing people that I'm surrounded by that are doing excellent mahi in all their different fields, and some of them are litigators and you know activists and and iwi leaders and all this sort of stuff. And I've been able to bring my experience to that table. And we've been able to have this epic um, session of, you know, reciprocity with each other and trade experiences and trade knowledge and call each other out and things and have it like a safe container of where we can really challenge and define our thoughts. And you said the values, really reassess mm -hmm. those thoughts and values. Like, do you believe, do you really believe what you believe? That's kind of like the, the essence, right? Do you actually value the things that you are valued? And if you do, yeah. Yeah. If you do, then carpi. But if you don't, why not? Or like, how can mm. we? Okay. Or how do we just? How do we attach you to what you really want to value? And that's why I believe that no matter how tough the conversation is, there's always value to be had in these tough conversations because you're either one, you're going to learn something new, or two, you're going to be reinforced in what you already believe. To me, those are really yeah. the a very basic level. They're the only two results of a tough conversation or any conversation like this. Fortunately for me, it's both. It's it's reaffirming yeah. things that I knew innately, um, but it's also challenging me on a lot of things <laughs> that I that I hadn't considered or you know. So I want to ask them because we've talked a lot about you know institutions and and colonialism and the influence of that. Would you agree or disagree? And we can unpack that. I'm not looking for a black or white answer. That in terms of Māori um, rising up to, to fulfil our potential, how important or is it even important to have Pākehā allies in this mahi? Yeah, okay. That's a, that's a great question. Um, hang on. I'm going to turn the light on because I'm just about plunged in the darkness here. There we go. Um, got a little halo above Yoda there now. <laughs> um, to have Pākehā allies, uh, for me, for me, I, I think I think it, it is. I think that um, if we think that we can set up some kind of Isolationism for me is not a way of protecting culture and language and, and, and who we are. It actually speeds up its decline. Nothing, um, nothing ha really eventuates from isolationism. Other people would disagree with that. They'll say, no, we need to do this completely on our own and be independent. And the fact of the matter is we haven't been independent for a long time now. And, um, all cultures evolve and shift. You see, I've got a little bit of a different mentality. Um, I actually think, you know, there is, you know, we were colonized and all parts of us have been colonized. And then we're going through this idea of decolonization. I don't keep coming back to this idea, but I've got this idea. Why don't we colonize the colonizer? One of the ways is to make them more like us. And so I think, and that's happening, you know, it's cracking me up. I, I was watching uh, last year or year before on television, two schools in Christchurch. Um, you know, I couldn't see a brown face really amongst them. Two schools at this rugby game doing haka to each other as a way of expressing their identity. Oh, a generation ago, unthinkable. But yeah. you've got 400 very fair looking boys on one side and 400 very fair looking boys from the other side doing these haka. This is who we are, our identity. You have Māori wearing, uh, non-Māori starting to um, look for Māori 
culture and language as their identity and a way to express who they are and where they are in the world. I actually think for me, that's the future. The true um, way to ensure that your culture and your language and your people survive is by sharing that with people, not by shutting it off. That's why English has survived because it's shared everywhere. And that culture is shared enforced. everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it is enforced. It is enforced, you're right. Mm. And there also needs to be an element of that where we are. We have to ensure that any space that we're in, that there is an understanding and acceptance of what's important to Māori in those spaces, regardless. And that is a fight that we go through every day. But it's also by saying something along the lines that not everyone's going to agree with this. But by saying, no, it's only for Māori. I think actually think that's a way to speed up its death and its decline. Because really, how many of us are only Māori, right? How many of us uh, are, are authentically only Māori? I mean, like, I'm, I love to be Māori. I'm Māori, absolutely. I also like um, the, the, the toys and the comforts of a modern society. I'm not ashamed to take my Māoriness into a modern context. So that's, that, that's my idea. Yes, I think it needs a collective uh, approach. Uh, to ensuring our, 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 the longevity of our culture. I was hoping you were going to say no, and we finally might have something to disagree on. <laughs> but, but, but running with that... We might have to get to different rugby teams so, or something to support. But um, running with that, though, because this... And this is, like, this is a selfish question, but I know that this is going to apply to a lot of people. And once again, I'm just asking your perspective. Um, I, I too truly believe that it's going to take a partnership, right? Um, I truly believe that we have to work together, whether it's simply because they are the majority and you need the majority to be on your side or to aid, to, at the very least to aid, um, in order to make any sort of sense of, of real change, any sort of meaningful change. So one thing that I definitely battle with is the fine line between appreciation and appropriation. Yeah, kia ora. Very difficult one, Ehoa, very difficult one. Um, but our the appropriation of our culture, and you know, academics, have, I know I keep coming back to this because I can't talk about any of no, this. That's, that's, that's your zone, brother. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm a one-trick pony, brother. I'm a one-trick <laughs> pony. Um, you know, funnily, um, the likes of George Gray came to Aotearoa to suppress Māori them, and then he ends up writing about them, right? And then you have these ethnologists like Percy Smith and Elton Best and uh, White and these Pākehā who make their livings and become the recognised experts in the Māori space because they wrote uh, their accounts that really that's the knowledge base of our ancestors. Mm. I think that stuff has got to stop. We've got to stop enabling from an academic sense, and this is just one example, but non-Māori telling our stories or telling the world who we are. We need to be out the front telling everyone who we are because there are some cultural nuances and some elements of being Māori that give a different flavour to the messages that go out there. So while I think non-Māori can support us, I absolutely think that the lead needs to come from us and we need to be steering the boat regardless of who's rowing the boat it needs to be us in control of what the way and the direction that our culture moves in. and i've actually been quite vocal about that um and in my own space in particular actually last week i spoke to a group of people exactly about this and no more non-maori telling maori who they are the the era of the ethnologist needs to come to an end let us tell you who we are and stop trying to, you know, be seen as the expert in our space. Yep, awesome that you want to be involved and support, but the expertise and the modi and the mana of that cordial needs to stay with the descendants. Yeah, and the reason why I said that it was a, a bit of a selfish question is because recently I had an incident where um, I was a part of some what they call anti-bias training. So helping us, you know, uncover our unconscious bias and stuff like this. And there was a girl in there, she used the term mana wahine, that she was going to channel her mana wahine to help us today. And I kind of buzzed out 
with it because um, she was Australian. And so I thought, oh, there must be, you know, she must have a connection to, you know, she might have a, a, a cousin or a sister or someone she grew up with, you know, because there's always, in our spaces, there's always, there's that one fair face who doesn't have any, who doesn't have any, um, you know, let's, for lack of a better term, like ethnicity or whatever that's within te ao Māori, but having that wouldn't make them any more Māori, you know? It's like they're, they're a white face that grew up on the path, nearly. So, you know, they've kind of had this, this, um, this consent, I guess, for a long time. And so like, that was my question to her, was I just wanted to get to know her and find out, oh, she must, I'm interested to know where she got that consent from to kind of use that. And she, she must have, you know, a pretty tight relationship or something. And I came to find out that it was just a, it was just a buzzword that she liked. And, <laughs> um, and, I, and I was kind of like, I was just baffled. I didn't get angry at her because I was like, man, this is so baffling. But I, I kind of like, when I get into these conversations or these spaces, I guess I'm trying to find sort of like a, a criteria because it is hard, right? To when is it okay and when is it not okay? for people to take lead on those things. But I guess from what you're kind of saying is that they can support that they should never be taking lead. You know, it, let, let me put it this way. I'm a, I'm a tūhoi person, right? That's my whakapapa. Yep. And fairly much I can go back into my communities and do certain things in those communities. And I can talk about certain things like the history of that community and, you know, my interaction with that community. And, you know, if I'm people say, oh, look, I need you to take the lead on this. I can do that. But as a tūhoi, I would not go into a neighbouring tribe and think I could do the same thing, mm. right? Because I know what that's saying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> go back to your bush, tūhoi, <laughs> you know. I, I wouldn't go and tell, uh, go into Te Arawa or another tribe. I wouldn't go to you guys in Taranaki and tell you how to suck eggs, right? Mm. It's not my whakapapa. It's not my place. Now, if they say, can you come over and have a quarter about this? Of course, we share straight off the bat there is an understanding when i'm in that space of someone else's tribe invited they're holding my hand i am under their mana and it's the same when it comes to non-maori wanting to do the maori thing i would expect them to hold the hand of a kaumatua in a symbolic sense or be under their mana but not to think that they have the right to go and really tell the rest of the world and and there's been some really prominent examples of that in recent years where you know one was an interesting one and uh gordon ramsay came over right did a cooking show i know this in the south island because i heard about this and I actually saw the show and the person who was speaking about the maori connection to the eel from that region and you know and talking about that knowledge and that matauranga was a non-maori not to my understanding with the old, you know with the authority from the people to talk about it but just said oh, i'm going to step into the space no i don't think that's right mm. you know as a as from a, as another maori from a different tribe i wouldn't do that to them that's not my story to tell yeah. i don't think it's anyone else's but the people who fuck up to that knowledge base so i'll give you a real world example as well something that we're going through i'm probably spending a bit too much time on this but it's interesting and i want to gain your perspective while i'm here we have a big thing not a big thing we well, used to let's say it's a big thing it's kind of been um dormant i'd say it's been it's been bubbling in taranaki for a while and that the use of the term the naki so iwi here in taranaki don't actually like the naki but we know that this has been commercialized through the rugby team, through other avenues and stuff like that, of that term being used. So uh, we had an incident not too long ago where McDonald's um, had actually printed on the box of their burgers, um, our meat is sourced right under the naki. And so I took that and put it online and kind of, I wouldn't say blew it up, but, you know, made a point of conversation about it. And man, there's so many people that are coming out and saying, it's just a name, who cares? Um, I've always called it the Naki, all these sorts of things. And I couldn't help. And so the example that I used was, you have to remember that this is named after a real person. It's not just a innate object. This is a real, this is a tipuna that this place and this moment were named after. And the people, the descendants of that people do not like that abbreviation because it completely changes the name of their mana tupuna. So 
for example, if I took your grandfather's name and just started calling him something that I wanted to, how would you feel about that? Big pause. Oh, no, but that's different. <laughs> yeah. So that's, I guess, to be honest, that's partly where that came from as well, as, as the training I had at Mahi, but also that. And, I, and, and they kind of come back and say, well, if we can't say it how we want to say it, then we just won't say it at all. And then I, and for me straight away in my head, I'm like, well, don't say it then, bro. <laughs> but then, but then I do wonder, does that kind of go back to what we spoke about before? Is that detrimental to the cause, and that we're shutting people out, and that they're kind of feeling shame? Um, no, I don't think so. I, I think that that's that. Where, that's one of those instances where, and I just want to say, I saw your post. I saw that. Oh, um, okay. and I thought it was very, very clever, actually. I did, well very it was a great response now I, I think that's just cultural straight basic cultural awareness but when they're trying to justify another culture's position from their own straight away there's inf- no not is a lack of empathy is a lack of lack empathy, of empathy. Right? and i think that is very evident in some of the older generation i actually think that there is a change and this is what i mean by the sharing of culture and you have you know i love seeing um you know people who aren't Māori, you know, trying to express themselves and their identity um, because, you know, I've heard one, you know, that sometimes the only difference between um, non-Indigenous people and, and culture uh, and yogurt is co- yogurt has culture, you know, right? They're clinging on, wanting some form of way to express who they are. And they're coming in drive, particularly the younger ones, into the Māori space to talk Māori and to have that element where they can express their Māoriness, oh, their, their identity, sorry. So for me, I think the stance is correct um, if, it, it, because it's not understanding how that's a desecration of that ancestor and that name, and, and I think that's a good stance. No, I don't think it's, it's – we, we need to draw some lines in the sand. Like, you can't do that. Yeah. Um, this is how this is done, and this is the respect that it needs to be given. It's funny too, bro, like, because they're obviously like, well, that's that's what you think because that's what you were brought up being told. Um, that's what your culture believes. I'm like, bro, I don't even fuck a papa to here. I'm talking on behalf of the iwi who know that I can help communicate certain messaging to people. And so that's why I'm saying this. But um, yeah, I did want to, I guess, wanted to touch on the, because it is hatuf, right? Like the appropriation and appreciation line is very thin but i love your distinguishing you know kind of for lack of a better term criteria or the way that you identify it is that appreciation is supporting appropriation is kind of trying to lead it and carry it as if it's yours yeah and, and i think and, and i think they're, they're even to the point where it's that commercialization of it and yep. you know like mcdonald's don't tell me that they're doing it with the best interests of the area. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, yeah. And heart, right? They're about one thing that's making money. Bottom line. That's what it is. It's a commercialization of an ancestral name that really had they gone to the appropriate authorities or gone to the local people. I'm sure they would have said, don't do that. That's disrespectful to us. Mm. Um, so yeah, no, I think there are some cultural, still a lot, a lot of, a lot of um, work to do, but you know, the good thing is, we're aware of it, right? We're calling it out. We're shining the light on it. Yep. We're saying, hey, that's not good enough. And it's getting a reaction. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years, they would have done it and just brushed any kind of complaint. Oh, just bloody Māori's complaining. Yeah. Now, you know, we do something and we, we call it out. We call it out. And I think that's a not much bigger... It's just like, I think for me, it's a second kind of wave of, of, um, of enlightenment kind of, mm, that's probably the wrong word, a renaissance. There's another wave of renaissance happening and it's born out of, you know, the other movements like Black Lives Matter and Me Too. And, you know, those have been so important in raising our critical awareness as people, you know, as people, as indigenous cultures, um, you know, I don't mean to just be kind of hammering on a certain sector of society. Um, 
but we need to highlight it. But it is changing. For me, that's how I feel. Yep, racism still exists. It always will in some form. But slowly and surely, those old systems are being overturned. That's how I see it. So I have great hope and faith for a much brighter and better future. I think it's important for people to, to know. And to be honest, I'm probably more saying this to our listeners and our watchers more than I am to you, my bro. But I think people need to realize that because I'm very outspoken. Um, and so, and these people that aren't, these people that choose to like say with these instances, there's a lot of people say with the girl that I'm here with or with McDonald's, they were like, we could go in and we can have a conversation with them face to face. It doesn't work, you know, calling them out online or naming and shaming, whatever. Whereas obviously from what I've done, I believe in the other side. But the point that I want to make is that we can do both. Yeah. Like it's not an and or situation. It's an and mm -hmm. and. We can have our, so this is my, I, I say we can have our Martins and we can have our Malcolms. We can do, we can do <laughs> both, you know. We can, yeah. we can, we can have our, or I suppose if you want to, like what I kind of actually say sometimes is we can have our Tarianas and we can have our Tamietis. <laughs> we mm. can, you, you, yeah. You don't have to be the same or do the same to be on the same page. Because I get into a lot of online debates and wars, bro. And then when I actually get them and have a conversation like this, they realize that we're actually on the same mission. It's just that we go about it very different ways. We are all individuals like our tipuna were. And there are things that we'll be collective about, but there are things that we'll disagree about. And I actually think what you do on a platform like this, the voicing of those differences you know, it's it's sometimes it's 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 a really important that as an individual you get to express your position. But I think on the flip side of that, if you're talking about balance, and that's the word you opened up with, yeah. I think one of the things that all of us need to can constantly check ourselves on, and I'm I'm like this, is making sure I'm listening to what the other person is saying yeah. and their opinion and thinking about it removing the emotion from it and thinking exactly what position they're coming from. Cause we, we talk past each other a lot, trying to get louder or more postured um, because my position is right. But I think what you do is allow a, a safe platform for people to express their differences. I think it's actually healthy. I think it's a sign of a, of a good society. Our, if, if our tipuna didn't disagree with each other, then why do we have so many you know, <laughs> battles and disputes and, and even to this day? Um, but I think having the platform for people to, uh, in a healthy way, discuss their differences. Um, you know, I know when my, myself and my cousin Che, you know, we, um, you know, I love my cousin Che and I have the utmost respect for him. And we did kōkōmuka, uh um that um maori kind of web series for a while with Browning Gloin and Pania Papa and um and we debated lots of topics now we're all very good friends and we're all very close to each other but there were times where we disagreed with each other we had different opinions and views on different elements and I think that's great that's really important and now that didn't at all impact upon the connections between us or the respect we have for each other if anything, and I, bro, love I, would, I would argue that it probably solidified your relationships though you say it had no impact i would say it probably did and that it probably made you closer because you know it adds that validity right like okay this fella knows some stuff better than i do whether we say that or admit that out loud to our cousins or not is a completely different yeah. thing but, but we were like okay I know that this fella's got my back and I've got his because they stood up to me and things that they disagreed with. So you say that it had no effect. I'm guessing what you actually mean there is that <laughs> it had no negative effect, but there was positive. No, no it had no, no negative effect, but I, I was, you know, I, I respected them. You know, that's their opinion based on their upbringing, based on their background. And if we don't, if we just agree and don't really, and that's what you're saying about believing <laughs> what you believe, if we just agree, that's actually quite dangerous because it comes out negatively. So for me, I know my cousin Che and the others, uh, you know, they respected me for my position and for my cousin, I respected him for being wrong. <laughs> He's going to watch this. He's going to see that. I like it. I like it. I like no, it. I'm kidding. My cousin, love you. <laughs> but question with your, um, 
because one of the big things that's happening, and I think it's a part of this uprising or this bubbling or this, um, you know, this, this sea change that we're seeing in, in Aotearoa society is, um, one, yes, we've spoken about how a lot of tauiwi are now being more embracing of te ao Māori, but I think a lot of it too is a lot of Māori reclaiming their Māori tanga. With yourself, bro, were you brought up in te ao Māori or was it something that happened a bit later on? No, it was part of my upbringing. I was very fortunate um, to have my grandparents uh, in particular, my grandfather who, you know, he grew up in a place like Vuatahun in the 1920s. Oh, yeah. So there wasn't a lot of English and uh, happening. And, and, and my father, um, that really was supportive in, in that um, approach and really tried to instill culture into us. And there was language and there was culture and then when I went to Hotelpaulder, that kind of really reaffirmed some of those um, learnings for me, you know. Uh, and then when I went to university, I really began to delve into it with my uncle Poe, and I was lucky enough to be taken under his wing. So it's been a bit of both. I was raised with it, uh, and to some extent, but then I was also trained and um, and and actually spent time. Look, it's you know uh, some of those cultural practices and languages as you you'll be well aware they take years and years of 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 learning and practice oh. and you know and um and i was fortunate enough to be um be part of, of that and i still still on a journey learning you know like um I, my, i've got friends who are maori language experts their language level is it, far superior to mine that's and an I didn't, understatement. yeah like well the likes of like leon blake and pania papa and scotty morrison and i get to hang out with these people and um you know i'm always learning from them i'm always learning from them all of the time and you know even when you're lucky enough and fortunate enough and privileged enough to be a teacher you always learn from your students and I, I get that all of the time. Um, you know, uh, you, you're in that process of teaching, but you're always learning. And I, I think as soon for me, that's a marker uh, that if I get to the place, uh, either when I'm, um, you know, I'm forgetting my own name or I'm not learning anything anymore, it's time to get out. Yeah. Um, I'm fortunate enough to say that I, I still learn on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, and yeah, no, it's a real... It's, it's real rewarding. It's such a rewarding um, space to be in, in that learning space. It's cliche to say, isn't it? But it's so true that if you're the smartest person at your table, then you're at the wrong table almost. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Almost, because, you know, I used to stick firm to that. But now when we talk about legacy and tukuiho, sometimes you need to be the smartest fella so that you can pass stuff down. And just because yeah. you're smart at just because it's things you're smart at doesn't mean, you know, that is the criteria be all or end of for what's smart either. Yeah. Important yeah. Bro, on that note then, Partai, with, with people that are quite disconnected from their Māori tongue or kind of just getting reintroduced to the culture, what would your, for lack of a better term, I guess, advice, but I guess just what, what sort of um, ideas would you like to propose or thoughts would you like to provoke in those people that, one, the people that are on the journey, and two, the people that are helping people on those journeys. Um, for for a mantra of mine for when I'm learning anything or particularly things around culture, there is the difference between learning, studying a culture and living a culture. Two different things. You can study a culture as a subject matter and become proficient in um in a particular subject but it's the living of a culture that we need people to be part of and by living the culture that's the use in, of the language and practice of those cultural practices and embedding it into a normal part of our everyday lives that's what it's need not to go away because if you study it it might as well your culture might as well be locked in a in a glass case in the museum so for me, it's about the practice of what you learn, not just learning to learn. Um, and on the other side of the coin, as a teacher, um, it's about realizing that you're in a privileged space 
and to be gentle. <laughs> I just think about some of the training that I went through and certain things to learn, you know, from, from my own and uh, at different spaces. And I'm probably the error as well. Man, sometimes it was brutal. <laughs> it was really quite brutal, but that was part of that course and I accepted that. But, uh, you know, when your identity is a key pillar in making a person who they are, and uh, when people are made to feel inadequate or less because they haven't connected with their identity as quickly or as strongly as someone else has, um, and that is used to hurt or bruise those other people then for me that's not acceptable um, and by doing that to people you're actually shutting off others who can have a massive positive influence over our culture so it's about being gentle you know and it's about helping people no one is more maori than anyone else just because you know language and culture sorry you know people say that no nah, you will have a better way to access your culture and you'll be a more involved with cultural practice but using that as a measuring stick to measure the value of someone or the maoriness of someone is 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 not right what makes you maori what makes me maori is my whakapapa yeah. i don't have to explain that to anyone i don't have to justify it's just where i am and i have some cultural tools that i'm lucky enough to be able to enact my culture but because someone else in my family doesn't have those tools doesn't make them less too hoy than I am. No, I just really, for me, that's a really important point. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad you say that because I feel like I spend half my life saying that to my to my cousins and to my aunties and uncles and you know people that didn't have the opportunity to even like to be honest. The main one that comes to mind is learning te reo. A lot of people think if you can't speak te reo, then you're not Maori enough. Um, I was fortunate enough to go to Kuruko Papa and I have my reo. So to some people in their world, I'm the most maori Māori to ever Māori. Um, <laughs> but, but that's just not true. You know, there's a lot of things that I'm still learning and I still don't know. So definitely don't let that be a, a measuring stick for, for how Māori you are. So thank you very much, bro. I, I appreciate you saying that. I'm, I'm mindful of time here. So I want to ask a couple of, I guess, more pointed ones. Tell us about, because we've kind of avoided it. We've done well to stay out of the box here. But tell us, tell us about the mahi that you're involved with, bro, because I'm, I'm interested to know, how did you even get into this realm? Do, so, we, um, do we credit Mary Dinsdale with that too? Or is that <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, so um, it's part of my family legacy, really. I'm a descendant from um, practitioners uh, and, and tohunga who were versed in astronomical star law. Um, and it goes back a number of generations, but it come down to an ancestor of mine, uh, Himi, uh, um, his name was um, uh, Te Koko, and his son Rawiri Te Koko, uh, Te Koko Himi ona Te Piki Kotuku, who, um, he was actually a, a, a friend and an associate of, associate of Elston Best, and who was putting roads through Ruatahuna and the Uruwera Forest in the um, late, 1800s and uh, best interviewed him for some star knowledge and gave to him a, a ledger it's like a big book um, and also an early nautical star map that best just happened to have as on as part of his possessions and um, my ancestor and his son spent the next uh, for three and a half decades writing a 400 page manuscript on uh, star law Māori star law um, near on a thousand Māori star names and over a hundred constellations and all of their meanings and purpose and what they mean when they rise and handed that eventually onto my grandfather who kept it in his cupboard for 50 years until the, I was at university and um, yeah, he gave it to me as, and I started to study it and he gave it to me uh, and told me not to, um, not to share it, not to, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, tribal knowledge and family knowledge. But then on his deathbed, he called me aside and he said, look, that book, you need to maintain the book. Don't ever let it go. It's an heirloom. But he said, but the knowledge in that book, and he'd been thinking about it. He said, look, you need to find a way to share that. 
knowledge that isn't shared isn't knowledge. It's dust. Those were his, pretty much his last words to me. And he sent me on this pathway. So I have been sharing that knowledge. I, I, I um, started to research and really get into it as my field of, of focus, I guess. And then I decided <clears throat> to write a book. And I was writing a book on astronomy, Māori astronomy in general. Started to balloon out and I got to the Matariki section and 130 odd pages later, I was like, crap, this is a book on its own. <laughs> I really, really debated about releasing that book. I did. I had finished the book, but I was like, oh man, as soon as I press send on this book, I will not be able to protect the mana of my ancestors' court at all. I won't be able to protect my grandfather or even myself from ridicule or doubt. And, and as Māori, we can be quite cruel in that sense. You know, and I didn't do it to tell other tribes uh, about their version. It was this is where this come from. I was I've always been upfront about that, and these are the connections and similarities to other tribes. And I did as wide a research as I could, and I thought, no, I don't want to send it. Uh, I don't want to put it out there. And then I reflected on my grandfather's words. You know, knowledge that's not shared as a knowledge, and find a way. So I I published it and. Yeah, it, it has been very, um, uh, it was changed my life anyway. It's, it's meant that now I'm in that space all of the time and I love working in that space. Um, and I think it's, I'm hoping that it's helped others like start to explore their own astronomical record. And, you know, um, I, I really did it uh, f to, to share that knowledge base as much as possible that, that I you know, was a, a privileged enough to have, but also um, as a pushback to non-Māori writing about Māori. Now there's a Māori who's a real speaking, um, connected and to his um, iwi and tribal practices Māori, who has done the research and is sharing for Māori as a platform for other work to be done. And so um, my life now is a little bit of Matariki Groundhog Day. <laughs> so I do a lot of lectures and a lot of presentations. And um, yeah, it's, I'm getting into some new stuff now, still on astronomy, but into um, like astronomy and time and from a cultural perspective and other stars and, and other corded. So um, yeah, that's pretty much, since we're talking in the box, here, what I what I do. So in light of that, because, you know, I, I love, I love, I think the reason why we're connecting so hard, bro, is because we're both really at the core of it. We're both little shits who love to stir up a system. Like, I feel like that's a lot of, a lot of the mahi that you're speaking to as well. You love to be in places where you can, you know, provoke people's thinking and stir things up a little bit. So what, um, what are some things that people don't know that would make them think, wow, about, you know, I guess some of that innate knowledge that people don't give Māori credit for already understanding, perhaps. Right, just off the bat, okay, there is empirical science within traditional Māori knowledge. It's just how it is. You do not sail that expanse of ocean on myths and legends. You, know, you don't talk about um, um, these whole mythical creatures and, and, and as, as if they're as if they're in that realm and then sail from Tahiti to Aotearoa. It just doesn't happen. You don't get here and incorporate a detailed division of time and environmental system and work in the environment and understand the intricate details and triangulation of rising of star, position of sun, moon phase, flowering of tree, migration of, of fish, spawning of eel, all of that without detailed observation and science. And then that science to make it have purpose and connection, we embed it into our cultural narratives and our ceremonies and practices. And then it becomes whakatauki and it becomes part of the language. And that's how the science lives. We have this idea that it's only pure science if it's done by um, a Westerner in a lab coat with thick rim spectacles. Mm. That's when it becomes science. And so, for me, that's one of those really key messages I want to enforce. Number one. Number two, within every Māori child, there exists generation of scientists, generations of practitioners of, who have done trial and error, 
and performed some magnificent feats that exist within every single Māori child. And it's not about filling that child up with that knowledge, really. It's about uncovering the knowledge that exists within them. And so that for me, yeah, <laughs> that's right, you know. We, 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 it's, it is the unlearning, but it's also that uncovering, right? Mm. And the other thing is that this might upset some people, um, but science and traditional Māori thoughts and, and, and mātauranga Māori, I guess want of a better phrase, are not enemies. Mm. Actually, those knowledge bases and the, um, the space between those knowledge bases, the interface, actually fits in the quite can fit quite well together if you're able on both sides to to give your lens and understand because oh, i love science i love science i love talking i don't have any training in any of it but i like to know about physics and um uh, quantum physics and um uh mechanics and engineering oh, i think science is just chemistry biology now, my interest in science does not come from any scientific training. It actually, this might kind of, well, it, it probably resonate well with you, Ehoa. Mm. Um, it comes to me from the hours I spent watching sci-fi. And with my dad, I spent hours watching programs, oh, might be a bit old for you, like Blake Seven, Sapphire and Steel, Doctor Who, Star Trek, um, buck rogers and when star wars come out i thought that's what i want to do i, I want to be a jedi uh -huh. and in those programs you think how is that science they actually confront some really scientific ideas like light speed and and and, and, and interstellar travel and aliens and um quantum mechanics and lasers and all of these things but what holds all of that together is the narratives. It's the stories. And the science actually exists in the stories. Now, that's how Māori did it. We right. embedded the scientific practice in the narrative. And I'm saying as a teaching tool for a next generation, I hope that we can use the narrative to reinforce the science because science without flavor is quite bland. And it's the flavor in the narrative. So, yeah, those are just a couple of things there. Cool. Yeah, I love how, see, for me, science has always been, um, science has always been the way of contextualizing magic. That's kind of, <laughs> that's kind of how I, I look at it, you know, and, and my idea <coughs> that yours comes from sci-fi, mine kind of comes from just overthinking. Like my, the first time I kind of knew that I kind of had a thing for science was I was quite young. I think I was like six or seven or whatever, and I was playing pool with my dad. And I, and I was going to beat him for the first time ever. No one ever beats my dad at pool. And I wasn't even 10. And I was about to beat my dad. And I shot for the black ball. And it come off the cushion. But it didn't come off hard enough to go into the hole. And for ages, I thought, why didn't that happen hard enough? I hit it pretty hard. So there were some other factors involved. And that was the physics, you know, the, yeah. the, the absorption rate of the cushion and everything that came into it. And that got me thinking of, the story within the story, which is what you're talking yeah. about. So, yeah. yeah, and you're right. Like, you know, when we look at, even if I look at as basic as um, Maui and the Sun, that's a story, but there's science within that story. Yeah. And it's funny that, that it's seen as being a story about science as opposed to being a science that happens to have a story to it. It's funny how yeah. it gets flipped yeah. around. Yeah. All right, yeah. the last question, I, I'm guessing your, your dinner's probably ready. That might be the notifications <laughs> we've been getting on your laptop here because we've gone way over time. But uh, the oh, last, question I wanna, last question I want to ask you, because this, this is the only question that I ask every guest, as you've seen, um, it's been unscripted and we've just been having a good time. Uh, but this is the only question that I make sure that I ask everyone. Um, and bearing in mind that you're not a mental health professional, what advice would you give someone who's going through a really tough time at the moment um, you know, life comes in peaks and valleys. They might be in the deepest of valleys. And drawing off your own life experience, what advice would you pass on to that individual listening right now? Um, yeah, um, I, I think one of the 
important things for me and, and when I'm feeling as um, in those difficult situations. Uh, you know, we all go through it in our lives. We all have moments of, of real lows is to talk and to find someone that you can talk to um, and, and other people that, um, and, and you can talk to and express how you're feeling and why you're feeling and that communications, you know, there's that old saying, you know, a, a problem shared is a problem halved. And we think about that, you know, it's said quite often, but it's actually about communicating because by voicing the feelings that actually brings those out of 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 you and 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 you're contextualizing and and voicing the way that you feel i think to speak it speak how you're feeling speak speak your truths but speak your feelings as well i think that's really important and it's something that is maori we don't do it's um we're often you know we 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 just just bury them down and just carry on but to speak those emotions out um, and even if it's it's in a space space where you're safe and on the flip side of that if we are people that are listening to others express how they're feeling and, and the difficulties that they're under it's to be good listeners you know not to cut them off I know how you feel because uh, when I was feeling that you know it's just letting them talk and asking them them questions like because sometimes you can steal someone's thunder by saying well you know that happened to me as well it's when someone's trying to talk to you in that vein you you know i think questions like why do you think that happened and you know how were you feeling at that time and what do you think you should do you know so you're getting them to talk about their context and i think to communicate it and then to be a good listener on the other side as well. I think sometimes talking about it doesn't solve the issue. Right? Talking about it does not solve the issue, but it gets the ball rolling in terms of your way you're thinking, even the help that can come to you, your way to a, that is a, on a pathway to, to supporting someone. So for me, that's, that's really important for me. Awesome, bro. We've had a lot of, a lot of value shared today in our quarter. We've talked about, you know, mentorship, the importance of guidance. We've talked about manakitanga. Uh, we've talked about the importance of a cohort and having, you know, people around you who you can debate and dialogue with and be challenged by, but still love each other at the end of the day. Uh, we've spoken about, you know, gratitude and worthiness. Um, te ao Māori's come up a lot, the whole appropriation, appreciation, um, oxymoron that is uh, all of that bro and we've, and we've also got to see the geek in you as well talk about your sci-fi time <laughs> and also shout out shout outs to Matua Yoda who you've got there on the back on the back wall um, and who who was that there's Mr G you said hey that's Mr G from Tauranga um, this is a, a Yoda with a Maori facial tattoo and a, and a tāmoko a, a heitiki and um, yeah it was a, when you put it out there I I I am a Star Wars fan. On the other wall, I've got the schematics for the Millennium Falcon. Um, so that's just a part of something that impacted me when I was a child. And I still am in love with the whole creation of another universe, another uh, alternative uh, universe and different aliens. And yeah, I yeah. love it. I sent you a photo of my one too, so you can have a nookie at that and see what you reckon later when you get a chance. But just another thank you, bro. It's been amazing connecting with you. I have a feeling we're going to do this again at some point because um, there's other things that are going to pop up that we can talk about. And I look forward to catching up in person one day and um, being cheeky and telling stories about Che. Well, <laughs> Uh, I think it's really important that we have these platforms for people to express their ideas in a real safe and, and, and healthy manner and, and to explore. Look, I just want to say thank you because it's the first interview I've really had that overly hasn't focused on um, um, the magnitude of certain stars above the horizon at a certain degree and, and the position of the lunar phase and 
you know, it's just to be able to talk about all sorts of kaupapa. Really, tino Māori nei tēnei kaupapa. Nō reira, tēnā koe hoa.